Happy birthday. We love you. Okay, how about if we pray together? Let's, let's welcome the Lord into our midst. Lord Jesus, this is your day. Just a few moments in your presence where we can recalibrate, realign, and reboot with you. Just a time, Lord, where we can come and listen for your voice. Holy Spirit, Maybe you've been speaking all week long, but we're just slowing down, taking a deep breath, and listening for your voice here. Father, we we give you honor and praise. We thank you for your kind intention toward us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. We want to come into your presence with a spirit of gratitude, Lord. But we need you. We need you to fill us up to speak to us words of life. So we're listening. We're listening for your voice. And Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you now as the one true God. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Friends, welcome to worship. You are welcome to take any posture uh, that you like. Sometimes uh, you, in a gathering like this, people stand when we're singing. You can do that. You don't have to do that. You can kneel at the altar. The point is this. There aren't very many minutes in the 168 hours that make up one week. There aren't very many minutes even where we take some moments just to intentionally breathe deep the breath of God. So we're going to do that. And I invite you now into worship of the Holy One. This is... this is. We're worshiping for an audience of one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So eyes on the Lord. Lord, we just do that. This is for you. Welcome. So if you want to stand, if that's your posture, we're going to be doing that singing now. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings. And the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, morning turns to songs of praise. Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves. Summer in the Psalms, and uh, recently, our daughter Libby and her husband Corey have been through some health issues, 
you've all prayed with us for Libby, um, but um, just a few weeks ago, Corey had a diagnosis that is now complicating things, and as a mama, it's kind of hard to just be like, how much can they take, you know, that's been hard, but Libby um, encouraged me, you know, I'm wanting to encourage her, but she said her and Corey have been reading Psalm 73 over and over again, and I would commend that to you. That's really encouraged them, but I want to read these scriptures. Um, Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. As for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, so I can tell all about what you do. I I love that. I know that sometimes it's hard when we go through hard things, but I know it's their heart and it's my heart and it's our heart when we worship that we're telling of the good things the Lord does. And sometimes the good is that he was with us, that his presence is our good. But he's also the one that makes ways for us when we need his help. We see him move. So wherever you're at in the journey of maybe you're doing just you're kind of floating on a high of good or maybe there's some things that are challenges for you we want to sing about how the Lord is our way maker and he is always a way maker of making a way for us to know he's with us for sure Waymaker, 
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. Ushers, would you come forward and serve us, please? Thank you. Let's just take a moment to um, think about this. As we start a new week, all that we have, if we're followers of Jesus, all that we have belongs to him. That takes the pressure of owning off of us, but gives us the responsibility of stewardship. So, Lord, as we take moments to start a new week of stewardship. 
we ask for your wisdom and help. Lord, you know that we have a tendency to think of ourselves as owners. But when we belong to you, it really all belongs to you. So Lord, we thank you for the way that you provided for us. And as we start this new week of worship, Lord, out of our relationships, our possessions, our dreams and our talents, we give to you. We give back to you and we ask, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom to know how, how do you want us to steward what you've put in our hands to care for you. Give us a heart for those around us, Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. Thank you, Brother Dave. Uh, one word about body life before we get to the word. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we will be at Dave and Debbie Powell's for home church. Uh, there will be food, and apparently the bathrooms are working. Is that right? Okay, good. So, I don't know. There you have it. Maybe that's the key to get you there if you want to come. We're going to gather. The church is gathering at Dave and Debbie's house tonight at 6 there will be food, and we'll take some moments to uh, be in the Word together as well. So, um, <clears throat> have you ever heard of a thing called cancel culture? Cancel culture? Um, it's the thing the other guys do. Think about that for a minute. <clears throat> cancel culture basically says... If you don't think the way I think, roll the way I roll, then you're out. Until you think the way I think and roll the way I roll. You don't do that though, do you? This is church. You've got to be honest. God's listening, right? So I do it. I did it this morning. And I didn't even talk to somebody. I talked to Diane. I didn't cancel her. It was on my way here. And literally the way somebody was rolling in their car was wrong. It was irritating. And I thought, man, I'm glad I don't have a sticker on my car that says, I'm a pastor. <laughs> but... You, you don't even need to say something to cancel somebody. Because you know where it starts? It starts right here, and it starts right here. And I can tell you their license plate number. I know, I've forgotten it. I can tell you they were driving a gray Toyota. Man, it is easy to cancel people, isn't it? It is so easy. And look, just to add another piece to this, we can get to a place where we're certain that God agrees with me. Right? Because we know this. He certainly don't agree with them. Especially if they were driving that gray Toyota. Right? So what is the mind of the Lord as it relates to these things? You know, he said to one of his prophets, um, you and your fellow human beings, you don't think the way I think. And the way you roll is different than the way I roll. In fact, God said, I think and roll at a, at a in a high 
higher plane than you do. And that's not just God being snarky, but trying to help the prophet and those that would listen to the prophet. Then how is it that you do think, Lord? And, and what would that mean for me if I were to change the direction that I'm going and start rolling in the way you're rolling and thinking in the way that you're thinking? and seeing people in the way that you see them. This psalm that we're going to look at today, I think, gives a snapshot of what the Lord's mind is and may, may even inform, at least for me, my idea of does God author cancel culture or does he author a different kind of culture? We're in the Psalm 130 today. This is part of the Psalms of Ascent. Remember, we've talked about this over the last few weeks. This is a collection of Psalms from Psalm 120 to 134 that the pilgrims that were traveling to Jerusalem for the festivals during the, the, the times, even prior to Christ, they would sing these short little songs. It was as if they had their playlist. Right? They had their phones or the MP3 players, or if you're old school, their 8-track cassettes. And they would play these songs. They would sing these songs. It was their playlist. As they traveled to worship the Lord. And these moments of travel would have cost them because they, they had three and they were trying to make... Some people would be there every festival every year. But some, it would be the journey of a lifetime to get to one and to participate in the singing of these songs. You can know this, that the Lord Jesus, as a little boy, when his parents took him to Jerusalem, as groups, they would have been singing these songs together. We're going to talk about the Lord Jesus at the end of our time together today. But what we're going to read here he would have sung. And I don't know the tune of it, but we're going to start out in that way. And I, I have a question that I want to ask you. What are you counting on? What are you counting on? What, what, are, what are your hopes anchored in? What's your foundation? When push comes to shove, where do you retreat to as kind of a, your Alamo? What's your Alamo? What are you counting on for that protection? That question will come up in what we're going to read here. Lord, as we take just moments to read this short little word, this song that was sung, we're asking that you speak to us in our day. We've made the pilgrimage here, Lord. It's not the same, we know, but we've come to worship you. We want to hear from you. Holy Spirit, we know that you can speak to us in ways that we can understand, but you also know that we need courage to follow when we hear from you. So we ask that you would do both, that you would speak to us as we read the word in ways that each one of us can understand you. And we pray that you'd give us courage to follow you. And we pray for this in, in hope and faith and with thanksgiving in the name of our Master Jesus. Amen. Okay, so this is Psalm 130. It says this. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on the Lord. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, 
hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. This is the word of the Lord. It's unknown who wrote this. But we know that many of the Psalms were written by David. Some of the Psalms of Ascent were written by David. This has the feeling of the story of David. And it it had me thinking about David's life. Are you familiar with, uh, this is King David now. He was the second uh, king of Israel, chosen by God. A man described as having a heart after God. One of the greatest kings in the history of Israel. But not a man without blemish. Not a man without sin. Not a perfect man. David was renowned for his military strength. He was a great warrior. He had a lot of military success and around him, the core around him, he had 30 guys that were known as his mighty men or his great men. And these were guys of like, they would have, they would, they were the original Marvel movie characters, these 30 guys. They were incredible, the things they accomplished. And they were loyal to David. And as David aged, he stopped going to battle with his guys when they were fighting wars. And on one occasion, it says in 2 Samuel, when the kings would go to war, it was in the spring, David stayed in Jerusalem. Why did he do that? Well, he was getting on, but... It was about to be one of the most difficult times in his life. And as his guys go off to war, he's in Jerusalem and he's on the, in his palace on the roof and he sees a woman that is not his wife and he lusts after her. And he says to one of his servants, who is that? Well, her name's Bathsheba. She's married to Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite was in the army, but he wasn't just any soldier. He was one of the 30, one of David's guys. He's one of his close circle guys, a man of renown who was going to get his own Marvel movie. This guy, Uriah, was the man. And he was married to a woman named Bathsheba. And David called for her and committed adultery with her. And then she she informs him, I'm pregnant. And David, you know what he did? He thought, how am I going to get out of this? So he calls, he sends a message to his commander in the field and says, send Uriah the, the Hittite, send Uriah back home. And they're out in battle. So Uriah comes home, and David greets him and says, Hey, you get, uh, you know, 48 hours R&R. Go see your wife. Just take, take some time off. You know what Uriah does? He's like, My guys are in battle. I, why am I home? I, no. And he sleeps at the door of David at the palace. David gets up the next morning like, what, dude, what, what are you doing? Well, I'm not going to go be with my family, my wife, while the guys are in the field. So David thinks, man, you, this, see, this is the character of Uriah. So he says, Uriah, we're having dinner. And they have dinner and they have wine and he makes sure that Uriah gets filled up. And he thinks, He'll be drunk. He'll go home. He'll sleep with his wife. I'll be off the hook because she'll be pregnant and everybody will think it's his child. You know what Uriah does? He sleeps at David's door again. 
And David's like, this guy is now becoming a problem. One of his guys, one of the 30 mighty men. And David, who's known to have a heart after God, is trying to cover up sin rather than to have his sin covered. There's a difference. When we try to cover something up and put it under and, and, and keep it a secret, that's covering it up. But when we bring something to the Lord and come under his covering, you know, that's totally different. When we try to keep things a secret, that's where shame is it just breeds and grows. And the more shame grows, the more we get shackled and chained and aren't able to move freely. That's when we try to cover things up. But when we come under the covering of God, under His conviction, He draws us to Himself. There's no shackles. There's forgiveness. But David's in a mode where he's trying to cover it up. Come on, Uriah, go spend some time with Bathsheba. Yeah, I'll send you back out on the field. No, he wouldn't do it. So he sends him back with a note, not Uriah. Uriah can't see it. It's for the commander of the army. And he says to the, when you go against the foe, I want you to send Uriah, when he go, they go up to the city wall, withdraw from him. And have Uriah stand, stand. And I'm sure David's commander's thinking that will leave one of our best guys vulnerable. But that's what happens. And Uriah is vulnerable to the enemy in the in the attack that follows after he returns to the field, and he's killed. So then David brings Bathsheba into his home. She becomes his wife. And God sends a prophet to David. And the prophet tells him this story. There was a man, he had a sheep, a little lamb, and he loved it. Loved it like its own. It's like, you know, like we might have a dog or a cat. It was kind of a house lamb, right? And it was they fed it and they talked to it in a different voice. You know when you, when you have a pet and when you have an animal. The pet, you talk, oh, this is an animal, it's a cow, hey, it's a different tone, isn't it? Well, this man's tone was babyish with this lamb. And there was another guy and he had flocks and flocks of lambs and sheep. But he saw that guy and he said, that's I want that lamb. And his advisors are like, you have field after field of lambs. Yeah, no, I want that one. So he took it from the man. And he, the prophet told this story to David. He went to David. He said, I got I to tell you this story. David becomes incensed. He's indignant. He's like, well, that man who stole that that little lamb, he should pay. That was wrong. He should pay. And the prophet says to him, you're that man. And right there, what happened was David's sin got uncovered. He tried to cover it up, but it got uncovered. Have you ever had that happen? It, it's as if the oxygen is sucked completely out of the room and you feel like, so this is what death feels like when you're discovered. And the prophet says, you're that man. Wow. You know what David did? Well, he wrote several songs about it. I'll read you a portion of one. That child actually got sick and died. But David wrote a song, a psalm, about this experience and about his sin 
and about what happened when he didn't confess, when he tried to cover up. He described it as if his bones were dying. Physically, he was experiencing the weight of trying to cover up his sin. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 51. And this is in conjunction with this story that I just told you. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. When I was in seminary, I didn't go to seminary to be a pastor. I I went to seminary because this school offered degrees in counseling. And I thought, if I am going to be a counselor, I want to people search after wisdom. and And where is wisdom found? It's found in God and it's found in the Scriptures. And I thought, I should also learn how to study the Scriptures in order to listen to God if somebody's going to ask me for wisdom. Well, I think it was a long and winding road that God was taking me on to prepare me for some of the things that followed. You find that the Lord is doing that with you as well? The long and winding road, right? You didn't know the Beatles were writing a song about you and God. This guy, he he was a pastor here in Eugene, Steve Savalich. when, When we were in school together, I thought, man, I should move to Eugene and go to that guy's church. He said this, sin will hold you longer than you wanted to be held by it. Sin will cost you more than you wanted to pay and were willing to pay for it. And sin will take you so much further down the road than you ever planned to go. And that's what happened with David. He wrote this psalm, Lord, would you wash me? Would you forgive me? He was seeking something that he himself could not produce, which was a cleansing, freeing forgiveness. He suffered some consequences from this road that he went down. His good friend Uriah died. The child that was conceived between he and Bathsheba, that child died. There was a fissure, a crack that widened in his own family because of this. There were consequences that followed the action. And some people think that's evidence that God didn't forgive. (laughs) That's like saying, I want to be able to sin. I don't want any of the consequences, but I want the freedom and forgiveness of the sin. No. No, how we live matters, doesn't it? Now, you might be quietly reflecting on something that you either in your past covered up or maybe even currently is covered up. And I have had to reflect on that same thing in my life to speak these words. Can we agree it's not the funnest place to be? I want to read for you again the Psalm 130 and share with you just a couple of other thoughts. Again, Psalm 130. From the depths of despair, I call for your help. Could you hear it, David, maybe? Calling for God's help. After the prophet said to him, David, you're you're the man. You're that man. 
I call from the depths of despair, O Lord. I call for Your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if You kept a record of our sins, who, O Lord, could survive? But You offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear You. I'm counting on You, Lord. Yes, I'm counting on Him. I have put my hope in His Word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He Himself redeems Israel, get this, from every kind of sin just in that little story that I told you about David you know what we have we have lust that leads to the sexual sin of adultery we have murder we have lying well that he's off and running isn't he and there have been plenty of times in my life where I could have kept up with David. How about you? Huh? But he says, I'm counting on the Lord. Who are you counting on? Are you counting on yourself? That, now, that's not always a bad option. I mean, in the short term, It it might not even be a bad option to count on someone else. I I have a friend. I went to a conference one time. My friend is not a follower of Jesus. And he wanted to know where I was going because I said, we'll be gone for a little bit. Maybe I've told you this story. If I have, my apologies. It fits here. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to a conference. What's it about? I'm like, well, I don't want to tell you what it's about. Because I think you're going to mock me for being a follower of God. So I tried to just be real general. And he was like, that ain't good enough. What is the conference about? Uh, And so then I kind of tell him, go to the conference. I come back and I need his help to follow me to to some store, uh, to to actually a mechanic to get my car fixed. And on the way home, he, I'm riding with him. He goes, how was the conference? I'm like, here we go again. It was good. What would you learn? I learned I should have never told you I was going to a conference is what I learned. And I said this. Well, I learned that there's a God and he's spirit and that God has an adversary and he's spirit. And at this conference, uh, I learned how to put myself under the influence of God and avoid the influence of his adversary. That, That was about as general as I could make it. And he said, huh, I guess everybody's got a crutch. Just the reason I didn't want to tell you. But then I said to him, everybody? Yeah, everybody's got a crutch. I said, Well, what's yours? Oh, well, now he's a captive audience of me in his own car. Well, okay, if I got one and mine is God, what's yours? If we all have one. And he was like, well, I guess it's my wife. And you know what I thought? I thought this. It's not a horrible option. Well, no, 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 she was a wonderful person. But, but, but that's not a bad option for the short term. But when somebody asks you the question, what are you counting on? If you have to retreat to the place when it's like they retreated to the Alamo, it's the last stand, what are you counting on? And he was saying, essentially, I'm counting on my wife. Sadly, that didn't, work out very well. And he's no longer counting on his wife. 
And the question still stands, what are you counting on? What's your crutch? In later reflection, after David wrote Psalm 51, when the prophet said, you're the man. You're the one that stole the lamb. He writes the first song, and if you want to know that, look at Psalm 51 sometime in your Bible. Not right now, but it says, a psalm of David for the choir, or something along that line. Essentially, he wrote a worship song, and he told the worship leader, teach this to the congregation and sing it publicly. Can you imagine the worship leader, the choir director going, you, you want this sung publicly? Dude, this is about that thing with Bathsheba. Write it. I wrote it, teach it to him, sing it. You know why? Because his stuff was no longer covered up under the carpet. He was now under the covering of God. And he had freedom that he didn't when he said that his bones were wasting away. Later on, in a time when he wrote another song, reflecting on this time, in Psalm, uh, let's see, Psalm 86, O Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask your help. So, remember I said, what, what do you think the Lord's mind is on cancel culture? I mean, does he agree with you every time you might cancel somebody? I knew pretty, pretty soon, very, I, I knew almost immediately, God didn't have the same angst toward the person driving the gray Toyota that I did. I wanted him to, but I had the sense that he didn't. I'm not even sure he really cared, other than I... He didn't want me to cause an accident. God's ways are different than ours. He thinks differently. This is what He does. He doesn't cancel us. He cancels the the penalty of sin. That's what God cancels. And you know how He does it? By forgiveness. Did you get pick up the last line of Psalm 130? His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. Even bad driving. Every kind of sin. This is what was proclaimed in the book of Acts about Jesus by his apostles. Acts 13, verse 38. Friends, listen. We're here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is declared right with God, something the law of Moses could never do. David didn't have the name Jesus. Jesus would come out of his his line but he didn't have he just sought god he knew i i'm wasting away under the weight of this sin oh god would you wash me would you forgive me and then jesus comes along and he says i am the one who will settle and cancel the debt and the penalty and his disciples said this We're here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Do you want to know the purpose statement of the church, not just this church, any church that belongs to Jesus? It's this. Sin can be forgiven by Christ Jesus. That's it. We gather in in many different forms, we sound different, we look different, but not this. This is the same across the church, across the world. This is the one message we have to proclaim. 
Are you burdened down by the weight of your sin? Do you wish you could get it uncovered and settled? There is one who can do that. Who? How? Jesus. I read it to you again. Everyone who believes in him is declared right with God. Something the law of Moses could never do. So I ask again, what are you counting on? Who are you counting on? And if there's something that's covered up in your life, and you might be one of or possibly the only person who knows it, what would you do if you thought, if it were actually true, that that thing that's covered up could be forgiven? Last words before we share communion together. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus gathered his guys together for one last meal. And it, it was a special meal because it, it was the meal that all of Israel had been sharing in small family groups from the very first Passover when they were rescued out of slavery in Egypt until this day. It was a dinner and a tradition like your Christmas dinners or Thanksgiving dinners or whatever you have tradition around that's rock solid. This was a rock solid tradition for Jesus and his guys and the, and the Jews. But then he added a twist because he was about to give his life as a sacrifice to settle the debt of sin. In this last supper that they had together, it says this in Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples. That would have been normal. The tradition would have been the same. But what he's about to say is going to turn this long traditional meal of centuries and centuries on its head. He says, take and eat it. This is my body. What? We haven't ever heard that one before. And he goes on. And he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and they're like, oh, okay, this, this yeah, this, this is how it should go. And then he said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice. Get this, to forgive the sins of many. And again, they would have been, what is Jesus doing to our traditional dinner? But they could have soon asked, what is he doing to our traditional life? He's about to do something that will change absolutely the course of all human history. He will offer himself as the settling sacrifice for sin. And that's why his disciples could say, if you put your belief in this man, you could be right with God. Do you know what that means? For, let's, let's personalize it. Right here, Living Hope, Eugene, Oregon, August 4th, 2024. Stop thinking about other people or the people back then. You and me. We have an opportunity, we have an invitation to be right with God. But it requires humility. Humility. Oh, it is hard to say, Lord, there's something under the, under the carpet that I've covered up. Just so you know, I won't be inviting you up here publicly to tell us all what's under your carpet. And I'm not going to tell you all of the stuff that's been under my carpet. And that has the potential to go back under there. 
No. We're all made of the same stuff, aren't we? Uh, we know how to get stuff under the carpet. Not just on it. But we also know the One who can forgive. So before we take this communion, before we break bread and remember the sacrifice of the Lord and His shed blood, wouldn't it be good if we just for a moment took a moment or two quietly between you and the Lord, I, I invite you to seek His forgiveness. If there's something that is wasting you away, weighing you down, ask for forgiveness. Confess that to the Lord. He stands ready to forgive. So I invite you into just some moments of silence here. An altar between where you can kneel right before the Lord. Lord, as we just take these moments in silence, would you hear our confessions? Would you forgive, Lord? Lord, for myself and my friends here, I pray this prayer. Have mercy on us, O God, because of Your unfailing love, because of Your great compassion. Blot out the stain of our sins, my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. I recognize my rebellion, Lord. It haunts me day and night. But I say to you, thank you for being so ready to forgive and so full of unfailing love toward me, toward us. Lord, as we take this communion together, we remember your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that you would be willing to offer yourself when you did nothing wrong, you offered yourself in our place and we remember that and we give you thanks and we ask that you give us courage now to follow after you. Lord, as we step, take our next right step in following you, we give you honor, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, I'm going to ask if you are ready and, and desire to be served communion that maybe you would make your way to the center aisle here and then just return to your seats. Or you can take your communion at the altar or you can hold it until I, I take it right at the end. But I invite you now to come and receive this communion in remembrance of what the Lord has done for you, what He has done for us. So, Diane, if you would join. Myron will uh, make sure if you have a hard time moving in a crowd, he'll bring it to you. Um, but I invite you to stand now, if you would, and uh, we invite you to the table.
are the beloved of God. He loves you. Personalize it. You. Oh, you're so dear to Him. He doesn't just forgive. He loves. He loves you. And as you take this, take it in confidence, knowing that you're loved, knowing that you're forgiven. God bless you as you do. God does not cancel anything but sin and the debt that goes with it. Let's be people that don't cancel one another. I confess I shouldn't have canceled that person in the gray Toyota. I repent of it now. Let's go into our week not being people who cancel, but people who point others to the one that cancels sin. Amen? Amen. Remember this. You are much loved by God. Much loved by God. God bless you, friends. Have a great week.